good evening. Uh, I will start by saying a few words in Polish, so please don't mind. Szanowni Państwo, spotkanie to odbędzie się zarówno w języku, znaczy odbędzie się w języku angielskim, ale może dostępne jest również tłumaczenie symultaniczne. Jeżeli chcą Państwo wysłuchać tego spotkania po polsku, to na dole ekranu należy wybrać przycisk interpretation i tam można wybrać język polski. Także jeżeli chcą Państwo się przyłączyć, to zapraszamy, a my zaczynamy spotkanie. So once again, good evening. Uh, my name is Jerzy Łazar and I have the great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth installment of Clio in the Land of Economics, which is an interview series organized with the Pilecki Institute. Our goal in this series is to showcase some of the most interesting research on economic history and good research on economic history is never far from social history. Uh, which is why today I am particularly proud to present uh, three distinguished guests, uh, two editors and one author of, these, of this recent book on the history of Central and Eastern Europe, part one of the Rutledge History Handbook of Central and Eastern Europe series published last year. Uh, professors uh, Joachim von Putkamer, uh, Stanislav Holubets and the third guest, Professor Bella Tomka, is uh, an author of some of the chapters in the book. Uh, the book forms, as I said, a par forms part of a, f of a large four volume set, which hopefully is going to be the next definitive historiographical treatment of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, of the history of Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th century. Uh, now, before we go further, throughout our uh, our uh, our discussion will take about 50 minutes. After these 50 minutes, we will have time to answer questions. Uh, so you're welcome to ask questions throughout the throughout the, our discussion. Uh, you can do it on Facebook. You can do it via Zoom, either via the Q and A or via chat, and we will come back to to them at the end of our class. Uh, we will start by I will start by uh, presenting my, my my guests in the, the, with some detail, and then we will talk. I will give a brief introduction uh, about the book, and then we will discuss the history of Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th century. So let us start with 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 my guests uh, to summarize their research in any degree of uh, in an, with any details. We probably take half of our class, so I will do it relatively briefly. Uh, Professor von Puttkammer, Joachim von Puttkammer, uh, has since uh, its inception been the director of the Immerkertis Collegium in, in Jena. And as you will see, the colleague will uh, return time and time again during our discussion. As, as the director of, 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 the, of this institution, he was the moving force behind the series of books we are discussing today. He has published extensively on 20th century, 20th century uh, Central and Eastern European history, often with a Polish focus. Uh, he uh, published on state building, on nationalism, on turning points, uh, as well as on violence, including police brutality. Uh, Stanislav Holubets uh, works at the Institute of History of the Czech Academy of Science. He has worked as a research associate at, at the Imlekertis College. Uh, and during his work there, he was one of the editors of, of this book. Uh, he has published much about social, uh, Czech social history, sometimes with a Valerstinian flavor, uh, about the memory of communism, about uh, about political movements in Central and Eastern Europe. And he co-wrote three chapters in the book we are discussing. And last but not least, uh, Professor Bela Tomka from the University of Seged. Uh, he is an economic and social historian and pretty much the foremost specialist on European social history in the 20th century, as well as on welfare history. Uh, in the volume we are discussing, he published, uh, he wrote a chapter of consumption and co-wrote another chapter with Stanislav on population and family. Now I have to say that I'm not entirely dispassionate in the treatment of this book since I also co-wrote one of the chapters, but I will try to keep my comments brief. I would rather uh, have my guests talk uh, 
than uh, listen to myself. Now, uh, the book we are discussing is a synthesis of, of social and economic history of Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th century. It uh, tries to, uh, because it's, perhaps let me ret retrace, to write a history of Central and Eastern Europe is always quite difficult. There was a joke during uh, communist times in Poland that integrating Central Europe is always a difficult task because you're going to get, and please excuse all those national stereotypes, you're going to get Russian honesty, Polish sobriety, uh, the German sense of humor and the Hungarian as the national language. It is not a very uniform, uh, it is not a very uniform region uh, and some might even question whether it is a region at all. Nonetheless, attempts have been made to study, uh, to, to, to write books on this subject over the last 30 years, perhaps the most prominent of those were the many works of Ivan Berendt. Nonetheless, obviously there was a significant lack of a new synthesis which would include people from the region. The problem of studying Central Eastern Europe is that there are languages here other than, and, than the so-called Congress languages. It is difficult for a Pole to write about Czech history if he doesn't know Czech. It is difficult for a Pole to write about Hungarian history and vice versa, because we don't know the languages. And so uh, the book we are going to discuss today uh, took a very uh, commendable approach by asking historians for all around the region, perhaps the larger number of Poles, though, I, I, I suppose, to look at the history of Central Eastern Europe from many perspectives. And we, uh, as the authors, we, we approach the topic of challenges of modernity, as we will, as we will see through our, our discussion today, modernity appears and re reappears from many, uh, from many perspectives as a sort of the the basso continuo of, of, of our research. Now, um, even though uh, Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th century, it is countries which uh, went through, the, went, were under communist rule, but were independent in the interwar period, which is rather broad definition of countries between Russia and, and Germany. Um, even though their history took, in general, a rather similar direction, they went through a period of independence. And I said, as I said, and later, uh, they all were ruled by various uh, versions of communism. Nonetheless, they don't form a very uniform, uh, a very uniform group. In fact. Uh, to some extent, as I read those chapters again after five years, I saw that while we were all writing about Central and Eastern Europe, there was a very visible other in many of the chapters. In fact, in some cases, uh, it was easier to learn about Western Europe because in all the chapters, Western Europe was an ever-present reference point. Some authors uh, took a more traditional approach where Central and Eastern Europe was treated almost like a backward suburbs, suburb of Europe. Others stressed uh, its local specificities, treating it as a region sui, sui generis. Uh, now, this is a topic which has troubled historians over the last few decades. In Poland, not as much, although recently Larry Wolf's seminal uh, Inventing Eastern Europe was published in a Polish translation, so perhaps there is going to be more discussions of the, on the subject. Now, uh, Professor Tomka, if I might start with a question towards you. Uh, your research in this book, as well as in, as in your books on European social history, has a strong comparative flair, and you use comparisons uh, with other parts of the European continent throughout uh, your writings. Could you explain from your perspective whether we can even talk about a separate Eastern Europe or is it just that suburb of Europe as we have in the title of our discussion today? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to uh, thank for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, well, I will try to uh, answer uh, your question, but first I would like to make some uh, 
more general comments about the uh, regional structure of, uh, of uh, Europe. Actually, uh, if Central and Eastern Europe or any other region uh, in Europe can be regarded as a, as, a, as a separate region, as a sui generis region, is a par excellence European issue because regional divisions have probably been more prominent uh, and their meaning more contested in Europe than in other parts of the, than in any other parts of the, of the world. We usually do not talk about the regional structure of uh, say um, South America or Latin America or even Asia. So this is a, a par excellence, once again, a par excellence uh, European issue. Several historians and other social scientists perceive Europe as a system of historical regions uh, with center and peripheries. And they differentiate between uh, Northwestern Europe, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Europe, uh, Central Europe, East Central Europe, or even West Central Europe as Oskar Halecki did. Southeastern Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes they, these regions are called meso regions because they occupy a, a medium uh, position between or an intermediate position between uh, Europe as an actual region uh, uh, in global terms and uh, and the national uh, or societal level. Of course, there are many other. Uh, more ad hoc regional concepts as well, such as the city belt or the blue banana, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in my view, the very concept of Central and Eastern Europe, which uh, is applied in the book, is a fairly elusive uh, term, much more elusive than, say, East Central Europe, for example. But it is in my, uh, I can assume, or I assume rather, that it is an intentionally loose concept because the editors and the authors had good reasons to apply a flexible uh, term, a flexible spatial term, uh, because the book covers a huge geographic area and perhaps even more importantly, it covers the century, the 20th century that brought about several profound ruptures, breaks um, in the social and economic changes in the region, not to mention the territorial changes, of course. So thus, uh, it is possible that in the inter that for example, in the interwar era, uh, some areas say the Czech lands did not fit Central and Eastern Europe, uh, while in other periods, say during the 1970s or 80s, uh, they did. Uh, and a more exactly defined concept could not grasp uh, or handle uh, this. So if we wish to address this issue you just raised, uh, we have to take into consideration two major facts. First, we have to relate uh, this region or the region we are analyzing to other parts of Europe. And second, uh, we are using a dynamic concept. So uh, changes, took place, uh, changes took place inside the region uh, during the 20th century. Needless to say that all this makes a general answer to your question very difficult, but I don't want to be fully inconclusive, of course. So I will try to uh, make some points concerning your, your original question. Uh, even though I am not sure uh, that the suburb, the metaphor of suburb is the most plausible one because suburbs are usually more affluent uh, than the actual towns or cities. Uh, life expectancy is higher in the suburbs and the level of education is also usually higher. But apart from this, yes, um, 
uh, East Central Europe, or rather Central and Eastern Europe, sorry, Central and Eastern Europe uh, was a kind of uh, suburb in the sense that if we take this region as a whole and the 20th century, once again, as a whole, as a single unit of analysis, there were considerable differences between, say, Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe. However, it is more interesting to see how the particular dimensions of societies evolved during the 20th century in that region and what the dynamics of changes uh, was. Uh, I think the most productive approach to this is if we look at the convergences and divergences inside the region, inside Central and Eastern Europe and between Central and Eastern Europe and other European uh, regions. Uh, this is once again a complex exercise, so I can only make some passing points here, uh, but you can find a lot of uh, the readers can find a lot of information concerning uh, this issue in the various chapters of the book. The unity of the region, and this is my first substantial point, uh, the unity of the region has increased during state socialism, or if you like, a kind of homogenization took place in, in that uh, region. A lot of hard data support this claim, I think, but several other less uh, 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 quantitative, softer observations um, uh, uh, also support this, this uh, uh, point I made, I think. First, I picked the economic performance, which is one of those areas relatively easy to quantify. And uh, in that area, in that field, the changes, for example, in per capita GDP clearly demonstrates the economic convergence in the region in the post-war era. First of all, Czechoslovakia's advantage moderated and the Balkan countries caught up with the uh, other ones. Uh, or as far as the social structure is concerned, uh, employment rates, for example, in the major economic branches became more similar throughout Central and Eastern Europe, mainly, of course, as a result of the fast industrialization in Southeastern Europe. The same holds for a related phenomenon, urbanization, even if the growth of the population in, in towns and cities was the result of the, often was the result of, 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 of rural, the so-called rural urbanization was again, clearly and very convincingly depicted uh, in the book. And my final example is the consumption. Uh, true, in these societies, uh, there existed different consumer cultures uh, and uh, consumer practices, experiences in the post-war, post-Second World War uh, decades. But the so-called shortage, shortage economy, a term coined by the Hungarian economist Janusz Kornai, so the so-called shortage economy everywhere in the region prevailed, even in Hungary, which was often considered as, as an embodiment of the goulash communism, a kind of uh, socialist consumer uh, society. I actually would not uh, buy this uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the shortage, the shortage of uh, of um, uh, consumer uh, durables, uh, quality food products, etc. So the shortage was a kind of everyday experience and the source of grievance of the entire population of the region in these post-war uh, decades in Central and Eastern Europe. So once again, in my view, shortage was the main uh, main specificity, 
of the consumption history of the region after the Second World War. And I think this kind of common consumption regime was the major factor facilitating the unity of the region. Uh, so uh, of, beside, of course, the similarities of the political uh, systems. Uh, as a result, state socialism stood out as a period of increasing internal social and economic unity of the uh, Central and Eastern European region. This process, this internal homogenization, if you like, this process was elevated by the social and economic divergence from other regions, most notably from other European regions, most notably from Western Europe. This divergence was uh, palpable in several social and economic fields, including the ones I touched upon, so economy and uh, consumption, etc., but did not dominate all aspects of social life. I would mention three notable exceptions. First, the role of women uh, in family and society at large. Uh, the family structure, that's the second, and the interpersonal relations in family. And uh, the third example um, is uh, leisure, leisure patterns, actually, so time budgets, etc., etc. Um, I am running out of time, I think, so let me conclude by a short reference to the determinants of convergences and uh, uh, divergences, divergences, even this, uh, uh, even if this um, uh, problem is well beyond the scope of my ten-minute uh, presentation. So um, the the major factor, if if we look at the periods of the twentieth century in in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the the periods when there was a kind of convergence to Western Europe and to other parts of Europe. Uh, so these periods were the ones when the, the region was characterized by openness, uh, openness to Western influence, Western capital, uh, Western ideas, Western institutions, etc. And the periods of divergence, vice versa, of course, the period of, of uh, periods of divergence were the ones when this uh, region, uh, for various reasons, isolated itself or parts of the region isolated themselves uh, from uh, outside influence from mainly, of course, Western influence. So that's it. That was my very short and uh, very well, uh, uh, very short presentation. <laughs> so so thank once you. again, uh, thank you so much. So once again, basically we see the West as a, uh, as a unifying factor, even though it is outside of the region. When all countries are sort of focused on go coming closer with the West, this really, con this, the consequence is a convergence. By the way, I, I very much enjoyed your comment on, on suburbs because this is the result of the Polish language having a different meaning. In Polish, the word suburb has a negative connotation, unlike in English, with w w without the, uh, the the American connotation of suburbs. Now, uh, the other two gentlemen, would you like to comment on the on the concept of Central and Eastern Europe, Professor von Putkamer, for example? Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, um, when um, uh, conceiving of the idea for this volume, there were basically um, two ideas, or maybe three ideas behind it. Um, the first one was that we um, thought when we started this in 2010, that we might be far enough, uh, uh, distanced enough from 1989 um, to take a fresh look at economic history of the 20th century um, and not see 1989 as the end point. Um, when we started, we had... Um, basically comprehensive uh, perspectives on Eastern Europe that were um, that had been written in the 1990s uh, with the deep economic crisis um, that came after communism. 
uh, and the debate on whether communism had um, <coughs> had um, been a failure after all um, uh, and had um, failed to bring um, Eastern Europe out of this position of what you call uh, suburban um, mm -hmm. or backwardness as it was at the time mm -hmm. and whether the um, imminent um, <coughs> um, uh, adherence to the European Union might um, uh, provide new prospects and we were trying to take a broader look um, at this. Uh, the second um, uh, challenge uh, was to um, to pick up on, on those um, <clears throat> tendencies in economic history that were giving economic history a more cultural touch. We have some uh, chapters in this volume, um, yours and um, uh, Party Bela Tomkas, which are um, very, um, um, <clears throat> how would you say, genuinely economic history, uh, but we also have other chapters in there which are uh, picking up on the more um, cultural um, aspects that are looking more at perceptions of how people perceived what was happening um, um, with them, to them, um, and how they try to make um, sense of it. Uh, and the third um, refers to what uh, you've just earlier discussed on whether the countries we are looking at actually do form a region or not. Um, if we were to write a book on the 19th century, I would say no. <laughs> I had been addressing, um, um, or I had tried to write a comprehensive history of um, <coughs> Um, East Central Europe uh, being Poland, um, um, the Bohemian lands and Hungary, historic Hungary in the 19th century and 20th century, um, but without the Balkans. Um, and there you can, one can argue um, that the period under consideration, if one starts from around 1800, that it's um, a specific um, uh, constellation of um, noble uh, estate agriculture being partly highly modern uh, in some regions, Bohemia, for example, but also in parts of partitioned Poland, um, let alone Hungary, um, which does shape the economic development, um, a specific role um, uh, of nobility also shaping the cities um, and a specific um, <clears throat> um, position of cities within the larger um, economic and political imagination uh, of this region, let's say north of the Danube. Um, and the Balkans are totally different. Um, they are just emerging from, um, from Ottoman rule, um, some earlier, some later. There's basically, aside from Romania, no uh, estate holding nobility left. Um, they are much more um, dominated exclusively by peasants uh, and upward peasant mobility. Um, and this, these differences, um, they begin to level out as Professor Tomka has just uh, mentioned throughout the 20th century not just in the second half um, with the, um, the um, rigid um, economic conceptions of, uh, of socialism, um, state socialism, but already in the interwar period um, with, the, um, 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 with nation states, small nation states uh, striving um, for um, uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> organizing national economies um, that could pick up uh, on, on, the, on, on, uh, on imperial traditions, um, on what had been modern before the First World War, but also trying to, um, um, to find their way um, between re-emerging um, Nazi Germany then, uh, and the, of course, the enormous pull and challenge of the Soviet Union. Um, and this, these countries, uh, this, this, these are unifying factors um, um, <coughs> um, along the lines which um, Bela Tomka has um, just, um, outlined. Um, maybe this much as to the earlier discussion. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe uh, Stanislav Holobitz also wants to add to this as being uh, one mm -hmm. of the responsible editors of the entire volume. Uh, I think uh, our starting point was that uh, we uh, defined our region as uh, an a European area which came out from the process of disintegration of the big multinational empires. Uh, which uh, happened first uh, in case of uh, Ottoman Empire, but uh, after the World War I uh, was the case of um, uh, Russian and uh, Austro-Hungarian and German Empire. And uh, uh, actually uh, uh, what uh, I found uh, so fascinating, even we were, we were conscious of the uh, big differences between this so-called Southeastern Europe and East Central Europe, so area of Balkan versus the area of uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, there were as well uh, similarities. Both uh, uh, these regions experienced the Second World War, 
both these regions experience socialism and uh, post-socialism. Both uh, these regions experience uh, the interwar independent statehood. So even the differences are big, there are as well similarities. Uh, but uh, what, uh, uh, what is also striking for me after writing the volume, I think I have uh, to reconsider or we have to reconsider or think again about the concept of East Center Europe, because it seems to me that uh, Poland and uh, where's uh, the former Habsburg Empire make uh, a bit two different places or areas because uh, uh, the, the tradition of uh, Habsburg countries uh, versus tradition of those parts of Poland dominated by Tsarist, uh, Tsarist empire differed uh, enormously and uh, as well quantitatively because uh, Poland is uh, as big uh, as big as the rest of East Central Europe or even even bigger and uh, the, the tradition the traditions are different and last but not least uh, we included also uh, Baltic areas, uh, so uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, which uh, is a quantitatively a s a small unit. It's not uh, big than, uh, f f than, let's say, altogether Czech Republic. But at the, at the same time, its historical, its historical fate is interesting because it clearly belonged to our area only in interwar period of time and then during post-socialism when it got uh, won again the independency. But during the state socialism, it belonged to um, Soviet, uh, Soviet Union and uh, uh, therefore, uh, th th therefore its fate is different. But uh, I think, uh, I think uh, these places belonging to Baltic area with uh, an influence of Scandinavian countries or Finland uh, uh, are and influence, let's say, culture influence of of Protestantism are as well an interesting uh, interesting um, place um, place to um, work on. And quite difficult from my memory of working on the chapter. We don't know as much about the Baltics as we do about the other. Now, uh, thank you so much for your comments. Now, uh, Professor von Pulkama, you mentioned in your in your answer the 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 existence of relatively modern, um, relatively rich uh, agriculture in some lands of Central and Eastern Europe in the 19th century. And now when, when, when you read through this, through, through this volume, you see time and time again, a very similar phenomenon. It actually starts in the first chapter by Błażej Brzostek, mm -hmm. uh, who mentions the phenomenon of parachute architecture. The, the idea, the, this concept of buildings which were designed by Western architects, which are catapulted or parachuted into a Central European city, and they don't seem to have anything to do with, the, with, with their surroundings. And in other chapters, we, you find other examples of this parachute modernity, of insular modernity, of uh, significant discrepancies and ruptures between rich areas and poor areas. Moreover, w when you look at the examples, you see that uh, these elements of modernity are often uh, external. I think it's in Stanislav chapters, uh, one of Stanislav's chapter, when he writes that it was the market which which gave much of the of of early impact of modernity on on much of the population. Uh, later. Uh, it was mostly the state bureaucracy. So we have a book which is called The Challenges of Modernity. And it seems that at least for much of the period, modernity was an external element, or at least something which only formed a, an island or this parachute implantation in the region. Could you comment on this idea of modernity as an external factor? Um. I'd rather comment on on the um, the parachute figure first. Um, thank I, you. I think, um, sure. Um, uh, but they are they are obviously linked. Um, now, um, um, this notion of a parachute architecture figures only once, um, and it's uh, it, it's not the gist of the uh, the argument of the book. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I would say it is probably um, an issue that um, begins to haunt us um, today more than it would have twenty years ago, or even. 40 years ago, um, because it's um, something which doesn't seem to go away so easily. Um, if you look at um, economic theor uh, theory um, from the um, 
mid 20th century onwards. Uh, and here I'm specifically thinking of Alexander Gershenkorn because that's where I um, encountered um, this notion first, um, is that a belated industrialization um, uh, brings about specific tensions uh, between um, 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 regions or phenomena which are um, totally competitive uh, and technically as advanced as anywhere else um, in the most advanced countries, um, whereas other um, um, parts uh, or regions of the country uh, don't really uh, follow uh, suit as quickly. And, and it's those enormous tensions, um, um, which of course you will be able to see throughout the book. Um, and you can also say that the um, state socialist um, um, attempt uh, was one to break out forcefully, um, uh, to overcome these tensions by, by forcefully breaking away from, from constraints. Now, if you look at the cover of the book, uh, you've held it uh, into the camera. Um, Do it again. Yeah, there it is. It shows, it shows a group of men um, with two motorcycles um, somewhere in the countryside. Um, I can't uh, really recall precisely where in, in the countryside, but that is already telling because it could be almost anywhere uh, throughout the region um, in um, uh, maybe not in Estonia and maybe not in Greece, but I'm not fully sure even uh, about Greece, uh, if you look at the trees. Um, um, so, uh, and it's, it's, it's rural and it shows the advent of something um, which seems to be, and that's why we chose it. It seems to be um, a social event, um, uh, but there's also some hesitancy um, with the men. You can see it's, it seems to be at first a mostly male thing, <laughs> um, of course. Um, whether a motorcycle is something which is specifically uniquely Western um, or something uh, authentic um, is, of course, open to debate, depending on which kind of motorcycle this is. I'm not a technical uh, historian of, uh, of technical development, so uh, I couldn't tell as quickly. But what it shows mostly is that um, what, what we call modernity, uh, and not just we as historians, but also people at the times, um, came also to the countryside um, in many regions, not evenly, but it did. Um, and it came as a promise, not as an alienation. Um, um, and this um, hints, I think, um, uh, mostly at those debates which we have not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but all over the globe um, um, uh, in these days, um, on <clears throat> to what extent um, um, global integration and technical developments which originate elsewhere um, and which one has to follow to remain competitive could actually competitive economically and politically um, and to secure a safe uh, a, a standard of living and offer um, prospects, um, how is the state can shape them and how to shape them in a way that eases social tensions, um, promises welfare to everyone um, and um, uh, can be perceived as something which is, um, while you being unifying, not being too alienating. Um, uh, and that is, uh, I would say, a current which, if I were to um, uh, redesign um, uh, the volume and discuss it with the authors uh, nowadays, I would probably emphasize even more than we did when we discussed uh, the general outline of this book uh, in the early stages of uh, its conception. Mm -hmm. So, was this, so modernity as a, as a promise, which is something we might be losing uh, over the last decades, but this is the changing Morris of the time. We are no longer an optimistic society as a whole, I would say, <laughs> especially today. But on the other hand, if it weren't for the pandemic, I wouldn't have the pleasure of, of talking to you since uh, we wouldn't be able to, to meet in person, probably. Uh, any comments? If on, it weren't on... for the pandemic, you would have invited us to Warsaw <laughs> and we would have made a use of all the merits of modernity to be there and discuss in person. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe I'm being overly, overly pessimistic. You're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, any comments, gentlemen, Stanislav, perhaps? Uh, I, I just wanted to add what we discovered. Uh, it would be misleading to speak just simply about the West and Western influences and parachute, because there is no one single West. There are, uh, if we examine the things uh, close enough, we realize sometimes it's, let's say, the influence from Germany. Sometimes it's an influence from a Roman part of Europe. Let's, uh, if, if we take uh, the education systems. So the north of our region 
uh, East Central Europe is clearly uh, was clearly in, since 19th century influenced by the German concept of gymnasium and university universitat and and uh, south uh, uh, southeastern Europe was uh, clearly influenced from France yeah from uh, like Serbian schools Romanian Bulgarian schools and second uh, it's not uh, simply parachuting but it's as well modification so something comes and but it's uh, modified according to local conditions so uh, uh, speaking now in the time of um, corona period uh, i can give you example with spread of crematorium which i'm dealing with in my chapter because the concept the very concept of crematorium started in germany and spread in early 20th century to east central europe to habsburg empire but in some countries it succeeded more in some less and it depended in uh, its religion traditions and in in poland it i i believe it did not succeed because uh, of uh, the tradition of second world war and uh, nazi mass murders but uh, it's succeeded extraordinary in the czech republic so czech republic concerning uh, percentage of cremation is today the number one in the whole uh, European Union, but this concept of crematorium almost did not succeed in East Central Europe, in Balkan, yeah, because of its culture, I suppose, uh, Orthodox Christian traditions. So we can we can see it's not only parachute, but it's as well uh, influenced by local conditions. If, if I remember correctly, the nearest crematorium to people living in the Habsburg Empire was not from from Vienna in Gotha, right? If, uh, <laughs> I think yeah, you, you had to skip, go over the border to get cremated. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Tomka, any comments? A very short comment, uh, because uh, parachute modernization uh, has a kind of negative connotation. And uh, um, I would like to stress that social change is always uneven. Mm -hmm. So there are gates of changes, uh, there are centers of changes where these uh, innovations and these diffusions concentrate first, uh, and then they, they move uh, away, uh, move out from these uh, centers. So uh, I, as an economic historian or economic and social historian, but with a, a real interest in uh, uh, economic theory, uh, I would like to stress that this is not necessarily a negative uh, phenomenon. It's a quite natural thing that that uh, uh, first first changes uh, occur in an isolated context. Context. This is how any dispersion happens of ideas, of technologies. The, the, this is natural, but it can be uh, shocking to the observer if, if the observer is not, does not know this. Uh, I see that we're running out of time, but I would love to ask one more question. Uh, perhaps this is Stanislav now. Um, I think it was in your chapter the knife that I really uh, noticed the important role of a certain turning point in history of Central and Eastern Europe, which is not normally written about, about so much in political history. I mean, obviously there's the, the, the uh, uh, we know about the Prague Spring, we know, we, know, we know about 1968 in Poland. However, generally speaking, the end of the 1960s is not a huge turning point in political history. Now, as I read the book, I, Time and time again, I found examples of major changes which occurred in this period. I think in your chapter, the most uh, interesting uh, inf piece of information for me was the fact that social mobility in the communism pretty much stopped or slowed down by to a significant degree after the end of the 1960s. And we have many other phenomena, the, the surprising trend of falling life expectancy in, in males after 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 the 1970s after the 1970s and obviously the economic crisis which sooner or later occurred or in Polish case a, a major crisis by the end of the 1970s. Now, uh, 
so this is a, a, a turning point, which is obviously, which seems to be really important from all of these chapters. This is not something we generally talk about. Why, why do you think there is the case and where would you see the, uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, origin of this turning point? Well, I think concerning the political turning point, so for somebody coming from former Czechoslovakia at the end of the no. 60s, it's as well an important political turning point. But you are, you are right. Uh, many of these big trends start to stop, change, reverse uh, since the late uh, 60s. You mentioned uh, starting, starting stagnating life expectancy or I can add, for example, stagnating numbers of university students, which increased uh, massively during 50s, 60s, but then since 70s, it started to stagnate. Or uh, we have uh, this uh, ossification of employment structure that there was no shift uh, to third sector to, uh, to services and uh, the industrial stru structure of uh, state socialist countries uh, remained uh, conservative or we have uh, uh, what, what we have seen was a, a strong neglect of infrastructures. So for example, no construction of uh, high speed uh, railways or uh, of highways in the, in the region. And uh, this uh, closing down of uh, social mobility, which, uh, which you mentioned, and as well in, in culture policy, we have, uh, uh, when speaking in Poland, we have a turn in uh, sexual policy of uh, several communist countries. We have in Romania uh, the ban on abortion, uh, on abortion for example, and uh, uh, also in uh, several other countries, the conditions for abortions has been tightened. Uh, in the in the 17th, for example, in in Bulgaria, so uh, I think I think uh, this uh, process shows a certain cycles of uh, state state socialism from the first, let's say, uh, revolutionary period, which was very strongly connected with post-war reconstruction, uh, to the to the period of stagnation, or if uh, I may add another point from culture policy. As we know, socialist countries were one of the first in Europe which introduced uh, the um, liberation of uh, homosexuality uh, in the late 50s. But uh, this uh, policy did not continue in the, in the 70s or 80s when the state socialist countries uh, remain stagnating in this respect. Or we can mention as well uh, female rights that uh, state socialist countries were the first in Europe which uh, introduced uh, the expansion of females uh, in, uh, let's say, university technical education or in some sectors as judges, doc medical doctors, or even in policy in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, the women were more present in socialist countries than in the capitalist West. But again, this, uh, this uh, turn or this did not continue in the 70s, 80s. So the, there was no female prime minister in the 70s in socialist country, but there were, there was, there was Margaret Thatcher and there were other, other important female politicians in the, in the Western countries. So um, I think, I think it's, it's uh, actually showing to us, it seems to me that the state policy in Soviet bloc was not uh, so much touched by the cultural revolution of the, of the 60s. And uh, therefore, the changes which happened in the West at the time uh, were lacking, uh, were lacking um, in our region. Yeah. Uh, Pastor von Pilkama, you raise your hand, uh, Jinx. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank uh, you, Stanislav. Um, I would fully uh, uh, agree with what Stanislav Holloway just said, uh, but I also would say this is only half the picture. And again, here it, it's, it's challenging um, and fruitful to look at uh, what is being discussed for Western Europe at the same time. Um, because in the um, from the early 1770s onwards um, in Western European economic history and social history, uh, the early 70s are being discussed as an onset of crisis, uh, the crisis of high industrial modernity, um, mm -hmm. where um, <clears throat> um, um, the notion that um, modernity can be planned, um, that there's a stable trajectory towards the future. Uh, is being shattered where uh, digitalization or computerization uh, begins to start changing. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> industry where um, um, the service sector is growing. Um, um, of course, the oil crisis hits the West um, at least as hard as uh, uh, the East of Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and also the stability of life uh, trajectories um, is not as um, uh, uh, certain as it was before that one would uh, be able to um, educate for one profession and work in it for, for one's entire life. Um, and, um, and I think that's part of the picture which Stanislav Holobets has just shown. Uh, at the very moment um, when they promised that, one, that the Eastern European countries could actually catch up and maybe even overtake um, the West on the trajectory to industrial um, high modernity, the West uh, was departing from it. Um, uh, let alone economic theory, which um, uh, was beginning to change from the 1970s onwards and where we can now see the core of current economic um, thinking um, more towards market fundamentalism or neoliberalism, as you, uh, if you want to call it that way. Um, um, so I find this extremely interesting to see that this crisis, which the West went through in the early 70s, actually turned out to be an advantage, um, whereas the um, Eastern part in the moment where they thought, um, one could have thought uh, by economic planners that they were about to make it, uh, they were sort of didn't see that they were about to lose it mm -hmm. um, and didn't have the structures to, uh, to pick up on, on Western reactions um, to, to this crisis anyway. I remember a paper, thank you so much for this comment. I remember a paper from historians from the University of Warwick, I forget the name right now, who, uh, who looked through Soviet literature from, from the interwar period, which was the basis of, of, of future economic policy, uh, and tried to see how the factors which were considered to be uh, important for future growth would then predict growth for other countries. And I mean, this was an obvious exercise. You would see cement, steel, etc., heavy industries. And obviously, these were not long-term predictors of growth from the 60s onwards. So we can see this very, we can see very much how the uh, lack of change in the economic model results in deterioration in, in, in other areas, as you both have have shown. Professor Tomka, uh, uh, any comment on, 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 this, on this point? Mm, no, thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, then finally, um, perhaps a, a sort of, um, oh, may, I suppose we are running completely out of time, so perhaps we should change, uh, we, we should try to answer some of the questions which have been asked. Now, uh, so first of all, let me thank you so much for, for the answers on these three questions. I hope that we've uh, uh, convinced our readers to take a look at the book, add that Central and Eastern Europe is, uh, is not this complicated jumble of different countries doing weird things, but, an, but uh, a really interesting part of, of Europe, which with, with, a specific, uh, with a specific trajectory in the 20th century. Uh, and take me, let me take a look at the questions. So first of all, uh, where do I, oh, okay, so, so the first of the questions by Sir Michal Borkowski, he asks that, uh, let me read the question. Would it be useful for uh, Central and Eastern Europe focused area studies to take into account the fact that some parts of the countries were formerly parts of different areas? Should we take more into account the fact that there are different imperial, uh, heritages of different parts of Europe. I mean, I will say that obviously, yes, this is something which, which has to be done and what we do, but perhaps one of you could, uh, could try to answer this as well. Since Stanislav said that from the outset, the concept of the book was to take a look at countries which came from the dissolution of empires. So this is something which is at the very core of our, of our discussions, is it not? I suppose I answered the question my, uh, no, myself uh, to some degree. Well, I, uh, I'm not quite sure in which uh, um, direction this is heading, but I would find this to be more fa most fascinating for Poland and for Romania because there um, the, the border of former empires uh, runs through right straight through what is today uh, a nation state, um, and um, we know for for both countries um, that these. Um, uh, differences uh, that 
played out particularly in the 19th century um, uh, in this first industrial modernization, even if we look at the architectural heritage, the infrastructural heritage, um, Stanislav Holowitz spoke about schools um, and um, Central European and Southeast European traditions. You can still, uh, they still make themselves felt uh, after more than a century um, later, both in Poland, I would say, the Russian and the uh, Prussian and the Austrian partition, but also um, in uh, in Romania. Um, and one could uh, um, <clears throat> uh, try to see where they were being, um, where they where they might have even caused new divergencies or where whether we can actually within this framework of the nation state um, see convergencies which begin to level out these um, um, these traditions um, i'm surprised that they're still there um, mm -hmm. after every election in poland sooner or later someone posts the map of election results versus partition mm -hmm. uh, borders and it's it's here all the time with some interesting changes. Those changes are perhaps the more interesting things. I see there's another comment on Facebook from Mr. Kwasowski, who won, which is quite interesting. He, uh, the, uh, the motorcycle on the cover of the, of the, of the book, Mr. Kwasowski says, is uh, to some degree a, a symbol of the, the technological backwardsness of communist countries. Although I'm not sure whether this picture was taken before the war or after the war. I, I'm not sure, to be honest. That's off, definitely after the yeah. war. It's, it mm. comes from a uh, Magyar render, Hungarian mm. policeman. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, 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 uh, it, I would guess it's a Pannonia motorcycle, mm. but I am not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it's definitely after the, the mm -hmm. Second World War. It's in the, it should be in the early 50s or mm -hmm. something. Judging by the clothes and yeah. the shape of the motorcycle, absolutely. So, so the comment I think says, I'm, I'm yeah? safe to say that when my father was in his 20s, in the early 50s, he rode a motorcycle in West Germany, and it was not more modern than the one we see on this book cover. <laughs> no, actually, these were not, not as bad as... as one might think to that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, there is a uh, style stuff you're trying to say something i'm, I'm not sure if uh, always a motorcycle is a symbol of uh, poverty uh, because uh, uh, let's take uh, uh, countries of uh, southern europe where uh, the small motorcycles are very very much spread and I think uh, uh, it's as well a sign of a certain, uh, uh, a certain uh, standard of uh, living because uh, I think uh, uh, many people in Poland or in Czechia would like to have them, but uh, it's, uh, it, it would be perhaps uh, uh, too big investment to buy such a small uh, city, city motorcycle in contrast, uh, in contrast to car. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Especially in Cortes Trail, used car from Germany, which is another story to, to be told here. The the, the symbolism of a, of a motorcycle has certainly shifted over over the thirty years. I see that there are actually no more comments or questions. I think so. Let me take a, look, a final look at, at at Facebook here. I mean, because of this pandemic, we have to be uh, we have to juggle technologies rather than just talk to each other. What can you do? I suppose these are the, all of these, these questions. So once again, gentlemen, thank you so much for, for, uh, for agreeing to take part in, in, our, in our discussion. Uh, I very much uh, enjoyed the discussion and your answers. And I also, I'm happy that the book is out and we have the opportunity to read it. So thank you once again. Thank you for thank setting you. this up and inviting us. Thank you. Thank you, it thank was you. a pleasure. Okay.